Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections. Today, we're going to talk about new weapons, new weapons emerging in multiple wars. There's nothing like a war to develop new weapons. That's where they get perfected. And for this discussion, we have Carl Baker, Senior Advisor to Pacific Forum, uh, to help us understand what weapons have emerged and what weapons are likely to emerge as we go forward, uh, both in Israel and in uh, Ukraine. Welcome to the show, Kara. Good to be back, Jay. It's a, a topic that I don't spend a lot of time thinking about, but it's a, it's an important topic because we certainly are in the midst of wars these days, and it doesn't look like that's going to stop anytime soon. Yeah, well, you know, back, back on October 7th, uh, we were really surprised to see, I mean, I was, I think a lot of people were, uh, gliders. Gliders. When, when's the last time we saw gliders in a war? Um, and we saw these techniques with the motorcycles, that the kind of technique, war by motorcycle, war by hostage taking, uh, war by atrocity, war by tunnels. This is all kind of new. Um, but, but since that time, we've seen a lot more weapons that have been, I don't want to say underground, <laughs> under, that have emerged overground. And, and these wars, both of these wars, have demonstrated, at least to a substantial degree, um, that there's weapons development going on in the world, not just in the in the in the warring factions, but elsewhere, uh, who sell the weapons uh, or sometimes give them away um, to the warring factions. So what we have here is a, a crucible of new weapons, and I suggest it's important for us to look at that because a these wars aren't finished. There may be more weapons come out. Maybe war war in the pipeline, and B, new weapons, especially sophisticated, high-tech weapons, change the possibilities for future wars. Um, so uh, this will, you know, inform us as to what will happen in the future for future wars. So what are, you, what are your thoughts? What are the most remarkable weapons that you've ever Well, I mean, uh, uh, well, the ultimate weapon, of course, is the nuclear, the, the hydrogen bomb. You know, I mean, that's that's the one that has sort of changed the definition of, of warfare in some ways, that it's the ultimate, ultimate weapon that we have the capacity to eliminate civilization as we know it. And, you know, and that has has spawned a whole a whole several generations now of of weapons that are, are much less powerful, yet they're more sophisticated in the sense that they go faster. They're more lethal. They're they're more more autonomous, and you know, you you have you have all these weapons. But for example, you know the the introduction of drones has changed warfare, and the, not not everything is high tech. You know, a drone isn't isn't all that sophisticated. And I mean, I think the the remarkable thing that I saw just in the last two weeks is the attack from Iran. You know, in 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 two ways. One is the fact that Iran was able to to launch sophisticated missiles, drones, and all kinds of stuff at Israel. And Israel managed to eliminate all of it with some help from friends. But for the most part, it was it was the Israeli uh, Iron Dome system, a defensive system that actually stopped all these all these projectiles from entering uh, Israel. So, you know, so I think that's what's happening. I think with with which you think about the, the nature of warfare and the nature of these weapons is Yes, you still have the the ultimate weapon, nuclear weapon, as the most powerful, and the one that's still in limited to su limited su supply to a, a few major actors in the world, and that's why we are still concerned about nuclear proliferation. When when you see a, a country like North Korea uh, developing nuclear weapons, the potential for Iran developing nuclear weapons, you know, we 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 really are concerned about that because that that raises the risk of the end of civilization, you know, the, the worst kind of war you can have. But then what you also have is you have more warfare on a much smaller scale where you, you can have somebody like the Houthi rebels uh, knocking out or capturing ships, uh, threatening threatening commercial ships uh, moving through that, that, that area of the world. You know, so, so you have a, a wide range of weapons and a lot wide range of applications of those weapons that, that make it really difficult to figure out what do you focus on? You know, if you look at the Americans, the Americans are, 
are stuck with a bunch of legacy systems like old submarines that are becoming more and more vulnerable to to sensors that can that can figure out where they are in the ocean. They're still stuck with a bunch of old bomber aircraft that are are seemingly less useful than they were 50 years ago, 60 years ago when they were originally built. You know, and and the army of course still has tanks for, you know, unclear reasons sometimes of uh, what are they going to do with these when they're really trying to fight a, a much more mobile force than than they were back in the days of the fold of cap and and the potential of Soviet invasion of, of Europe. I get uh, some reactions from what you've said. Um, one of them is that um, these weapons, uh, we, we talk about, we worry about boots on the ground. We worry about sending our soldiers into harm's way um, as troopers on the ground, old-fashioned World War II style. Um, but in fact, um, you know, it's changing because the weapons are long-distance weapons. And the targets are different targets. The targets are largely civilian. You want to demoralize your enemy by hitting civilian targets. You know, that's what, in large part, that's what Vladimir Putin is doing. And the other, the other point that comes to my mind anyway is you talk about nuclear weapons, and uh, Putin has threatened to use, you know, bombs, and for that matter, tactical nuclear weapons. But that kind of, uh, you know, that's not the kind of deterrence that really works anymore because everybody recognizes what you have to say, namely that it would ruin the world for years, for, for centuries, or ruin civilization if you got into a real Donnybrook about that. Um, but what it means is that no, do not have moral justification for using nuclear weapons like ever, um, but Every, everything short of a nuclear weapon is okay. Even perhaps, perhaps a tactical nuclear weapon. But in any event, these very sophisticated, high-tech, and very lethal rockets and missiles and what have you uh, that, that are set off on civilian targets, that's under the, the cloud of the nuclear possibility. That seems to be okay. You know what I mean? So. So the, the deterrence feature has changed, and if you can figure out a very dangerous lethal weapon, it's okay because it's not it's not nuclear necessarily. The other thing is, uh, you know, this is this has surprised us in both the theaters of war. Um, I, I don't know if we can still say that uh, Ukraine is um, it's got a lot of sophisticated weapons, but it still has some, um, and it will probably have more. And it stands for the proposition that even a, a country that doesn't have all that much technology can build weapons. Um, and, and I mean, I, I, I distinguish Ukraine, say, from uh, the Houthis, because the Houthis are getting their weapons and their drones from elsewhere, from Iran, for example, mm. maybe North Korea. Um, but the Ukraine is really not getting them outside. Ukraine is actually building some itself, uh, which you, you have to give them credit. But that is an element. It's a feature. So things have changed, you know, civilian targets and long-distance weapons, a thousand miles for Iran. That's different. And, and the war has changed because, you know, you, you don't have a boundary where some guys are on one side of the trench and some guys are on the other. In fact, you could shoot at them from a thousand miles away with all kinds of weapons. So, you know, I suggest to you that this means um, that we can have wars where they're not even close anymore. They just take a pot shot over a thousand miles and um, do it by remote. It's different now, and it, and this is all new. Isn't it? Well, it's it's new, but it's not new. I mean, you say we don't have trench warfare anymore, but the fact is, is that in Ukraine and we we have that also. You know, if you if you look at what's happening on the ground in the Donbas today, it it is it is trench warfare. You know, so so you have that, but you also have all these other compounding kinds of of weapons out there also. So it it you know where do you where do you put your energy? Where do you put your emphasis when you have that sort of that sort of threat environment that you have everything from hand to hand combat to to the the hypersonic missile that you know arrives uh, thirty eight hundred uh, miles an hour. You know, so, so, you know, so, I mean, it, it, it really becomes complicated and it becomes a matter of allocation of resources of where do you want to put your money? Where do you want, what is most important to you? 
And and what's most important today may not be that important uh, five years from now. And that's the that's the challenge because these systems don't get developed overnight. They get developed over over spans of decades. You know, so so you're talking about you know the fifth generation fighter aircraft or the sixth generation fighter aircraft. Those things are are they take 20, 30 years to develop. You know, so so it really becomes complicated and. You know, and again, as I was talking about these old legacy systems, you know, once you've got one, you really kind of hate to let it go. You know, you might need it for something, you know, that you don't foresee. So, you know, so you've got, you know, I mean, the classic example is the B-52 bomber built in the 50s, you know, and we're still thinking about how we're going to put new engines on it and make it a, make it a platform into 2050. You know, so a hundred year old airplane that's still flying around trying to, trying to, fulfill some military purpose well you know uh, the cost feature is always in there and something it takes decades to perfect is very costly costly to design and test and manufacture and so forth but some of these weapons including weapons that have been shown to be very effective are cheap um mm -hmm. you know for example you know you can have a missile um, that costs a million dollars a pop and the, the Taurus missile we were talking before about uh, Germany and is in a collaboration with Sweden, and they developed this Taurus missile, which is a missile that a plane will have to carry and drop as an air-to-ground missile. It costs 1.1 to 1.6 million per copy, um, and 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 a, and a small um, in a small country like a David and Goliath match uh, doesn't have the funds um, to afford a whole lot of those more. Doesn't have the funds to afford, you know, the the airplane platform for that. Uh, on the other hand, these glide bombs that Iran has developed, and the rockets that are being used, and the drones are cheap. They're not anywhere near millions. They're, you know, they're maybe tens of thousands, and they're very effective and very frightening. Uh, and they will be better as time goes on. You know, they're the, so. I think so. The idea is cost is important, and cleverness is important, and deployment is important, and you can you can actually have a David and Goliath kind of you know situation uh, where the little guy has clever, high tech, um, built at home weapons, and that are a match, uh, or at least a deterrent for some of the heavy duty expensive weapons from a you know a big war power. Yeah, yeah well, sure. And and to go further, you you don't even need to have military weapons anymore. You know you have so much dual use equipment out there that you can use in warfare, in hybrid warfare. You have information systems. You know it's about connectivity, and it's about being able to 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 figure out what the other guy is doing faster than he can. You know, and and it all becomes uh, driven by by the by the precision, by the speed. And and by the connectivity of of those weapons, and so yeah, so it 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 just makes it more and more complicated. So you can't you can't just build an arsenal and say I'm done. You have to continue to figure out how your opponent is going to use defensive weapons to counter your offensive. Weapons. And and you know the, the and defense has found ways to do zone defense, and and penetration uh, actions are are defeated by by building, like I used to say, the Iron Dome in Israel is a perfect example of how these, these weapons are effective, but they're not effective if you can, if you can build a system that actually protects you, like, like the Iron Dome. And, you know, and that's where the, the, the small country, Israel, can actually build that system. You can't build that system in the United States. I mean, we, we've tried, you know, with, with the intercontinental ballistic missile defense systems, but it's really complicated when you've got thousands and thousands of miles of, of, of border that you cannot protect. Yeah, you mentioned uh, uh, connectivity, and I think it's important to just take a moment on that. A lot of these weapons, long-distance weapons, um, are more effective if they rely on the Internet, uh, on satellite connectivity. And uh, early on in the, in the uh, Ukraine war, Elon Musk, Turned off his uh, his mm. his satellite system for Ukraine, which was an outrage, because he made a decision that he really would rather support Russia than Ukraine, and he turned it off, and Ukraine was left high and dry without the benefit of the 
uh, satellite navigation. Um, and so that becomes another feature and a controlling feature in some cases. And I, I don't know if there's a replacement for that or an alternative for that. Because if you're talking long distance you, and, uh, you know, inertial guidance or some kind of internet guidance, you, you really do have to have a connectivity. So that, that is a factor going forward, don't you think? Oh, sure. Absolutely. And, and, and that's why, you know, one of the latest areas of, of uh, development is space weather, you know, is, is countering, countering satellites in space. You know, remember what is, it's but what, maybe almost 20 years ago now that, that Russia tested its anti-satellite missile, you know, and it, it knocked out a satellite and spewed debris all over uh, lower space, you know, and everybody was outraged. But don't think that that development has stopped. <laughs> you know, you, you yeah. have to know that everybody is busy thinking about how do you, how do you eliminate all those satellites that are flying low Earth orbit? Uh, observing what's happening on the battlefield and, and guiding weapons and all these autonomous uh, vehicles that are being being developed. So yeah, it's connectivity is important, and and the ability to destroy the other the the opponent's connectivity is is a critical component of of our defensive wars. Yeah, and, and you know the United States uh, spends something uh, over nine hundred billion dollars per annum on uh, on defense and i think a substantial amount of that goes to research and development of weapons as it should um and some of those weapons have been rolled out and some have not a couple i have noticed that just to mention to you uh and it started in israel israel was had the publicity at first over a laser beams a laser weapon um which could actually be a defensive weapon against missiles um, but it could be an offensive weapon, too, and it required a certain amount of energy, but it was actually much cheaper to to, to send a laser beam out than to send a, a, a big missile out. Um, and and uh, this is like a, a year ago, maybe, a little less. Um, and, you know, it was impressive that they had gotten to the point where it was very nearly a weapon. Well, a month ago, I, I saw something to the same effect um, on the part of the United States, that we were also doing laser beams, uh, and that it was potentially a weapon, but it wasn't really ready for prime time. Um, I think it's probably gone far enough now that it's had this publicity that it will be ready for prime time. And when it gets ready for prime time, A, it's going to change the, the calculus on cost, and B, you know, it, we don't know how powerful it could be. We don't know exactly the circumstances in which it would be deployed. Um, so that, you know, that's really high tech. The other thing I noticed that was high tech, uh, and I'll stop in a minute here, is these assault weapons. You know, back in the day with the uh, M14, it was pretty primitive compared to what they have now. They have all these scopes on them, electronic scopes. And the last thing I saw was they have bullets that are smart. And the bullets, you know, you aim the bullet at something and if the bullet goes off course, it corrects itself. Uh, that is really something. So your target has had the cake, had the cookie, um, if you aim properly to begin with. Uh, that's quite remarkable. So in street fighting, I don't know if the Israelis have this. I don't think so. But the U.S. is working on it and it would be you know, helpful with the troops on the ground issue. Um, so in terms of you know, the advanced weapons, and there are probably more. You know, Remember, we have, we have heard about um, sinister attacks on American diplomats and military uh, uh, officials using microwave and disconcerting them and disorienting them and making them ill and all that. Um, I mean, you got it. It's been covered by 60 Minutes a couple, three times already. Um, and the Defense Department is, uh, you know, not denying it. So I think it's out there, and um, we don't have it yet. Doesn't seem like, but somebody else does, and query whether that's going to be another kind of weapon to discon dis dis disconcert uh, your adversary. I'm sure it's in the pipeline somewhere, don't you think? Well, there's something. There's something you're talking about the Havana sin, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, in fact, I saw a news article just the other day that said that there was uh, 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 something happened when Kamala Harris made her visit to East Asia recently that there was some people who were with her that were suffering from the Havana syndrome. 
So whatever whatever it is, uh, it, it hasn't been clear. And and they've done several. In, the government itself has done several investigations beyond sixty minutes. You know, the government itself has has tried to figure out what it is because and the reason it's called Havana syndrome is because it was first noticed in Cuba. And so you know that sort of suggests who well, may be developing this thing, I suppose. Uh, you know, but there's something something out there, whether it's microwave. They they really haven't figured out what it is, or at least if they have, they haven't told the rest. Of it. And so you know, there's always that possibility too. Is that there there is probably a good understanding of what it is, but it is something that they really don't want to have everybody understand. So these kinds of things happen all the time. I, I, the, the general comment that I'll make about microwaves and you know, directed energy and all that stuff, you know, all this new technology. One of the things people do when there's a new emerging technology is they say, how can, what military application does this technology have? And, and some of it works out well, some of it doesn't. You know, when you look at lasers, I remember in the 1990, when we were looking at putting lasers on a 747 aircraft to shoot down missiles, you know, that, that program eventually withered away. It didn't, it just, they couldn't make it work, you know, uh, the missile defense system, you know, that we've been working on for, for years and years that they, every once in a while, you'll see that they're launching uh, missiles out of, or, or, you know, missiles out of, out of Kwajalein or out of, uh, out of Kauai uh, and, and Kwajalein for that matter, you know, that, that they're still working on this stuff and, it, and it's, you know, years and years that they, they try to develop it. And at some point they, they say, this just isn't going to work. So it's always difficult to tell what technology is going to emerge as the new successful weapon. I think, I think today, you know, the, the big ones are, are any kind of autonomous, you know, the, the sort of dystopian view of the future where, where robots are attacking each other and turning on its masters and all that sort of stuff that we've seen in the movies for a bit. Well, I think they get it from the movies, don't they? <laughs> that's, that's probably where the concept comes from. <laughs> Yeah, and and then the other one, of course, is is the hypersonic. You know, the I think there's you know there's a fear that hypersonic weapons are going to you know make so much defense, so many defensive systems irrelevant that there's a very big concern about about the the capacity of hypersonics to to change the nature of warfare. You know, but these things they they end up it it ends up always being slower than what you would think. You know, mm -hmm. the, the whole, the whole idea of autonomy, like I say, it's been around since the fifties, you know, and, and it's, it's maybe closer today than it was in 1950 when we had the dystopic movies of, of the robots ro roaming the earth and, and all that, you know, but, but it's still, it takes a long time for this, this technology to develop. And in the meantime, people are developing defensive systems to defeat it. So, you know, so now you've got, you've got all these drones that are moving from Iran into Israel, and lo and behold, they all get shot out of the air. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, defense is part of a war also, and just as we talk about weapons, we we should, you know, consider the advances in defense and uh, the Iron Dome and other, there's more, it's more than the Iron Dome, as we saw last weekend. They have, the Israelis have other systems too that are defensive yeah. against missiles. But you know, there's, there's one thing that strikes me from what's happening here, and that is, you know, essential creativity, cleverness. You know, I, I mentioned the gliders. It's pretty clever. Uh, you think about it, you know, and nobody ever thought of that before. And the helicopter uh, in the Red Sea with, uh, with the Houthis coming down uh, with a helicopter and taking over a huge big ship. Um, hey, that's, that's quite impressive. And all it was was an ordinary helicopter and a bunch of guys with automatic rifles. Um, that was impressive. And then you have, you, have, uh, you know, other smart, clever things that, that have happened that, um, you know, that, that are of great concern. And, and what I think what I, what I come away with is that it's not only the weapons, it's the use of the weapons, it's the clever deployment of the weapons uh, that, that is of concern. And there's plenty of room for that. You, you know, there's always room for, uh, for cleverness, I would say. And we are seeing that. 
Yeah. I mean, you've got, you've got, you know, you've got the hardware, you've got the software, and then you've got the user interface with those two systems. And, and there's a lot of room for, for creativity when it comes to how do you want to, how do you want to kill people? You know, unfortunately that, that, that is very much a, a industry that seems to thrive, uh, over the century and it, it never seems to run out of new ideas. Yeah, let's look at the tunnels. The tunnels in, uh, you know, in Hamas land, um, you know, hundreds of kilometers of tunnels. And I don't think the Israelis took that seriously enough. They knew it was there. They didn't know the extent of it. They didn't know what could be done and the things that could happen in the training. Uh, and, you know, that, that's just clever because it costs a lot of money. And, and, and let me say that this is kind of a weapon because... You know, talk about asymmetric wars and all that. Uh, propaganda uh, is a weapon, of course, we know. Um, and, um, you know, social media, in the way of propaganda, is a weapon. And trying to, trying to use proxies, that's a weapon, of course. And trying to, you know, um, ruin your uh, adversary's uh, public relations by lying about what your adversary is doing, you know, that's a weapon. Um, and so, uh, you know, I mean, I think there's, there's all kinds of new stuff that's coming around. And one of them, uh, and I'll treat it as a sort of a system rather than a weapon, is taking hostages in large numbers. That is going to happen again, Carl. Yeah, well, I mean, but hostage taking certainly isn't new. I mean, it's, it's been around for a long time. And, you know, and, and so, yeah, I mean, prisoners of war in some sense are... are hostages, you know, and so it, it, it is, it's something that, that has gotten a lot of attention in the, in the media, but yeah, I, I mean, the, what, what you're describing, you know, this hybrid warfare idea is the Chinese call it informationized warfare, you know, and, 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 and it, it is, it, you, you have the full spectrum and, you know, and that's, what's making it more and more difficult, I think, to control the technology, you know, back in the, back in the cold war, it was simple. We denied, we tried to deny so the Soviet Union technology because technology was the basis for developing weapons. Now, so much of the technology is dual use, multi use, omni use, whatever you want to call it, you know, that, that you can't simply control all the information system. You know, so now you're worried about, about, you know, kill switches and back doors into, into systems. And, and all this, and once you start doing that in in the era of connectivity and information based warfare, it becomes almost impossible to control that technology. So we still have control, you know, tree control regimes out there, but they've become somewhat irrelevant because you can't control all the technology, and you can't control what technology is going to be used for. Going back to your idea of people being creative and how to use things that probably weren't intended to kill people in killing people, you know? So I think that, that, yeah, that's part of the, part of the vagueness that's, that's intruding on war plan is, is how do you stop all this, all this, all these systems from being used against you in, in, uh, in a warfare situation? Yeah. And, and, and don't forget the, um, you know, the, uh, intelligence and espionage aspect of this. I keep thinking of that, those balloons over the United States. Mm. Uh, they, Carl, I'm, I'm here to tell you they weren't weather balloons. Um, they were not weather balloons. And, and there'll be more of them. And there'll be more countries using them. And they're, clearly they're trying to you know, get data on us, and just as China is trying to get data in so many other ways. And that data is useful on a strategic basis. Um, and you can say, oh, they're just, they're collecting everything about you and me, the way we were born, we went to school, who knows what. But when you take that data uh, in, you know, in sort of a large language model uh, for millions of people, that becomes uh, a, a tremendous asset if you're going to go to war. Likewise, if you're able to, uh, it, you know, get, get into a utility plant, electric plant, somewhere in the country and bring it down on a given day, that's a, a tremendous weapon uh, using the similar systems. So I think the internet is a, it's, 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 it's 
of interest on a number of levels, but it has to be considered in both uh, making offensive and defensive moves. And both sides, all sides, have to be working on that. But I'll, 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 I'll agree with you on your second point. Your first point, I'm going to say that you're, you're a victim of, of, of a paranoia that I think is overwrought. <laughs> in other words, I think, you know, I think the, the, the fear of the large language model stealing my personal data is, is somewhat, somewhat overwrought in, in American media. Uh, I do think, though, certainly, certainly, I, I agree with you that there is a huge threat to infrastructure with information warfare. I, 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 I fully agree with you that, that I think that's a, that's a threat that has really been overlooked. And when you think about, you know, what would, what would happen today if Honolulu suddenly didn't have electricity, you know, or, or didn't have a water system or, or the water system got polluted or something. Or didn't have telecommunication. Yeah. Or, or didn't have, didn't have the internet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine that. 30, 30 years ago? Uh, yeah, 30 years ago, we really didn't think much about the internet. <laughs> no, but we were totally dependent on it now. And, and so, you know, to me, and this is what I would like to get uh, to here at the end of our time. Um, but, you know, it, things have changed. And yes, there are still trenches. Yes, there are still bullets and soldiers shooting at their adversaries from short distances. Um, yes, there is still artillery is still relevant. Um, bombs are still relevant. However, the nature of war has changed. And if we look at what's going on in these two wars, these two active kinetic wars, actually, I shouldn't say kinetic because they're asymmetric is what they are. They're hybrid wars in every way. And if we make a list of all the aggressive maneuvers and weapons and you know, procedures and techniques that we have seen, used, and developed, we say to ourselves, you know, it's really different now. Um, you know, World War II would be different. World War I would be very different. Korean War would be different um, because of these different weapons. It would be at, at distance. Uh, it might involve germ warfare. Uh, it might involve, um, you know, this kind of uh, bring down the utility warfare. Um, so, and, and it might, might be smaller wars, smaller wars, more focused wars. Wars focused on civilians, wars focused on morale, wars focused on forcing people to give up or give up land. Um, the world is never going to be without wars. I'm sorry, part of the human condition. Look at look at history everywhere. But, you know, people say, "Oh, I want peace." Well, the fact is that human beings get into wars. They have since the day of the Stone the Stone Age. Uh, that's going to that's not going to stop. But the nature of the wars is changing rapidly. Because of these new weapons and techniques, don't you agree? Sure, I do. I mean, I I, I think that uh, that they they've changed and they haven't changed. That's you know that's the that's the big conundrum is is going back to where we started this conversation. You know, there's still nuclear weapons out, and they still have need. A couple countries in this world still have the ability to simply eliminate civilization, and and that that should be that should be frightening. But then when you look at the other end of that spectrum where you have minor local wars, you know, local war is a big war. If you're local, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many other people are dying. The fact is, is that you are. And so, you know, you know, so, so you, you, how do you, how do you really plan for this kind of a situation where you, where you have to be prepared for localized war? hybrid informationalized kind of war and all the way up to a to a, a global conflagration that uh, that simply destroys the yeah and it, it could happen I mean on our watch right here right now I mean for example you have Iran trying to run all these uh, proxy terrorist groups um that's a new kind of war we haven't seen that we've seen proxies I'll agree but um, we haven't seen proxies to the extent that we're seeing them now where you have one country, a, a state, a nation state, presumably with some responsibility for taking care of its citizens, and then you have terror groups uh, that are completely free and independent and murderous. 
uh, and have one controlling the other. This is like the breakdown of of, of nations. Uh, that's different. And wars be, being done through proxies, those things are different. And, and you, you spoke of nuclear. And yes, and nuclear is always with us now. But here is a rogue nation, which is a, essentially a terrorist state, okay? And I, I mean, I'd like to talk to some Iranians about that, but they're not available to me right now. Um, and <laughs> and And they will soon have a bomb. And they hate Israel. And they want to destroy Israel and whatever, you know, all the, the whole country from the river to the sea. With the bomb, you'll have a whole different kettle of fish when it's a rogue terrorist state. It's not that everybody who has the bomb is responsible or understands the meaning of deterrence. Some countries like Iran do not. This is another level of risk, isn't it? Well, uh, sure. I mean, but any any state that has nuclear weapons can be can be portrayed as a risk to the rest of civilization simply because there are nuclear weapons that that can be launched. And I, I understand that that there's the, the the sense that Iran is a riskier state. I would say that uh, North Korea probably falls into that category. Uh, when you look at at Pakistan, uh, you know how how stable is that government? I mean, the real concern is is the stability of the government and the and the commitment to the nonproliferation treaty that you know that that says we won't do that. Uh, you know, it really we're basing this on a on a treaty that people somewhat adhere to. Others say you don't adhere to it because you're not actually dismantling your weapons. You know, so so. Yeah, I, I understand that it's not it's not pleasant to talk about the nuclear aspect, and certainly, you know, as as Iran develops its its nuclear capabilities, we have to be concerned about it. But is Israel a responsible nuclear weapons state? Well, we've we've thought we've thought so, but uh, right now we question Netanyahu. I suppose. Yeah. On the other hand, he he is responsible to his war cabinet. I don't. I don't think he can go off half cock. But let me let me ask you one last question here. It seems to me that what we've been talking about with all these weapons and wars and you know the the kind of attitude that countries have, uh, both aggressive countries and defensive countries, what they have right now, public statements they make, the threats they make. Um, you know, it, it seems to me, and you're in a much better position to to speak on this than I am, we are in an arms race. We are in a global arms race um, that has come about, perhaps ex ex accelerated by these two wars. Uh, but in any event, we are uh, people are developing arms. They're learning more about arms. They're manufacturing arms. We take Germany, for example. It's, it's revived its uh, ammunition manufacturing, its weapons manufacturing. And I think there are a number of other countries. France is another example of that. Um, so, you know, when you start ticking off all the countries that are building, designing, using, exporting, selling, what have you, um, to so many places in the world, it doesn't make the world a quieter place. It makes the world, in general, a more dangerous place. And it is an arms race, isn't it? I, I, you know, I mean, there's a specific definition for arms race, and so I— I'm I'm not sure I want to say there is an arms race. There's always been an arms race in the sense that everyone has has consistently tried to develop a better weapon, a faster weapon, a more efficient weapon, a, a clever weapon, a clever use of a weapon. You know all the things we just talked about. I think that 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 is that is the case. So if that's what we want to call an arms race, then yeah, I think there is an arms race. Uh, you know, but it also it also goes back to to your sort of uh, well, I'll say your statement that well, there's always been wars, so we have to prepare for war. You know. Oh no, I only said there's always been war. I didn't <laughs> say we have to prepare for it. Well, but but if you if there's always been war, then then I think it logically follows that you need to prepare for them too. Okay. okay. <laughs> so. 
you know, I mean, so, so, I mean, that, that is the mindset that, that is a deeply ingrained mindset and it's deeply ingrained in the idea of national security. You know, so if you want to look at, at how do we, how do we escape this system? You know, ultimately you have to start looking at what is the source of this conflict? And of course the source is the socioeconomic entity called the state. Because everything is done, everything that's done in preparing for war is done in the name of national security. And national security is, by definition, security of my state. And, yeah. you know, and, and so, you know, so, so, yeah, there's ways to think about how to go beyond that. But certainly as long as we're satisfied that the state is the most efficient social entity to prevent chaos, that we're going to be stuck with this notion of national security centered on state survivability, state sustainment. Yeah, a really interesting um, you know, point that, uh, that this, the state at least has some responsibility to its citizens, um, but uh, chaos, there's no responsibility. <laughs> Take a, a, you know, the full panoply of the Second Amendment, that's chaos. And it's not the same as the state controlling things, but that's yeah. another another show, another time. I want to uh, I want to ask you one more thing. This came up. I, I I meant to mention it. And that is, a couple of weeks ago, there was a very chilling uh, segment on sixty minutes about mines in Ukraine. The Russians have been dropping mines, uh, planting mines against tanks, and dropping mines from airplanes uh, by the millions. Okay, it's going to take a long time to get rid of all those mines. But one of the kinds of mines that they brought, and, and this is was, was this is fellow who was heading his garden in front of his house. It was a perfectly Eastern European kind of thing. And he's got all his flowers growing. Okay, and one day the the Russian plane flies over and drops these little little green mines. They're five inches long. They're painted green. You can't see them in foliage. You can't see them. Um, and if you step on them, you lose your leg. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And by the millions, all over. Now, some of them will fail. Some of them will get old and rust, but a lot of them will be there forever. And, and what happened is the guy went out into his garden, um, going to do his roses that day. And he, he saw the mines come down and he pulled out 12 of them from his front garden, but he didn't see the 13th. And lost his leg. Now these mines are going to be in eastern Ukraine for a long, long time. It'll, you know, it, to, to to take out one significant mine takes a Ukrainian like a full day of of working ever so carefully to remove it. Um, this is going to affect the future of the country. Mines have a life, an afterlife. Um, it's a special kind of weapon. It's completely irresponsible if you if you scatter them among civilian populations that way your thoughts yeah mine well i mean that's why there there was a success what back in the 90s uh i guess with the with the anti-mine movement that they actually managed to ban anti-personnel mines unfortunately uh, it wasn't all completely successful because they're still out there you know and and they're they're in korea too you know if you ever if you ever have a unification on the Korean Peninsula. There's going to be people poking around in the DMZ for a long time trying to find all those anti-personnel mines up. You know, so so yeah. I mean, it's 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 sad and it's horrible that people are still using that kind of a weapon. But the fact is, is they're still out there. And uh, again, you know, it, it's a it's a fact of it's a fact of life that that those those weapons are still sitting there. They're still going to kill people. And uh, it it'd take decades to get rid of it, as you say. Well, thanks for this discussion, Carl. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure that it helps me feel better about anything. <laughs> but but that's the reality, and and we like to talk about the reality. Really appreciate you coming down and discussing these these very unhappy. Unhappy developments in the in the human race. Yeah, it really it really is a, a not a not a pleasant topic, you know. And 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 the reality is is that they're there, 
And and we have got, gotten a long way to go before we stop talking about it when we have countries around the world, in, as you say, increasing their defense budget for the in the name of, of national security. Yeah. And then we have a terrible, horrible, disastrous war, and people make agreements that it would never happen again. Uh, no more poison gas, no more, uh, you know, uh, biological warfare, well, that's not, no more nuclear proliferation. And next time you look, we forgot all that, and we're back to square one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Carl. Carl Baker, Senior Advisor at the Pacific Forum. I always enjoy these discussions, and I learned so much. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.